Hey. Today I wanted to talk about the future in a specific way that will kind of unfold organically. Um, I have a bunch of notes. Um, so I'm not reading from a teleprompter here, but I do have like um, bullet points I want to be sure that I hit, like I often do in these situations. And this is not, you know, specifically an ASMR video, but certainly a topic uh, might be considered boring enough that people could use it as such. So that's fine. So what I want to talk about, like I said, is the future, specifically uh, the future in regards to technology, and even more specifically, the future with regards to technology and artificial intelligence. Um, now, uh, interest in these fields and you know different uh, technological fields uh, sort of ebbs and flows. It comes in waves, you know, and it ebbs and flows with popular culture. Certain schools of thought can be in vogue for a while, uh, and sometimes that's due to a significant cultural event like um, a war, you know, or. Uh, less innocuously, uh, or more innocuously, or more positively, uh, a civil rights movement or uh, some sort of sea change. Uh, and then those things can fall off the radar again and be gone for decades until they kind of come back again with the next wave. That's assuming they come back at all. Often they don't. The virtual reality is a, a decent example of this. It's for as long as I can remember, virtual reality has been the next big thing. Even when I was a kid, it was always, you know, sort of just around the corner um, and it was going to be adopted um, by every consumer, you know. Uh, it was just on the horizon and it's still just in, in spite of the vibe and the rift and all that stuff. It, it's still, um, you know, just on the horizon as far as um, adoption and attachment rates go. Um and maybe a better example of this, and certainly more uh, a more analogous example for my purpose, is uh, space travel. Because space travel, uh, serious space travel, in the 20th century uh, was part of the zeitgeist, uh, fueled by this very appealing notion uh, that the tension and the sort of negative and dangerous competition between the United States and at the time the USSR, uh, cold, uh, during the Cold War could be parlayed into something uh, more positive. Those more positive things being space exploration, uh, planetary colonization, etc. cetera. Um, and to that end, a bunch of a bunch of things were done. Like, you know, nuclear weapons were repurposed into propulsion systems. Uh, payloads were um, repurposed into astronaut capsules. Um, and this idea uh, had traction you know, for a, a significant period. I guess maybe a brief period. It all depends on your your perspective. Um, but, you know, it was significant enough that it was even a rallying cry for politicians uh, for a certain amount of time. And then eventually more terrestrial matters took precedence. Um, uh, and that was, again, marked by cultural shifts and what seemed like sort of this unstoppable juggernaut of inevitable progress in the 1960s. Disappeared in a, in a couple of decades, but I guess really by the end of the space shuttle program, um, and it might be difficult to argue the benefits of funding NASA when we weigh it against uh, things like fighting global poverty. Um, but everybody knows the world doesn't actually work like that. There's not a simple tit for tat uh, in those kinds of situations. It's not like we revoke funding from NASA and then take those resources to feed starving children, um, usually that money gets funneled 
uh, into the pockets of lobbyists or to further terrestrial nation-based colonization <laughs> efforts. Um, and what do those things get us? They get us in trouble. They entangle us in imbroglios and fawas and jihads and, um, you know, we get in this mode, this colonization mode of displacing humans, destroying cultures, um, and we kind of wave this hubristic flag of manifest destiny or through a venal shield of religious piety, um, and we ultimately cause more problems, more starvation, more suffering on a global level, which sucks. Uh, and unification is our goal. Uh, it seems like what we need is a, a good old-fashioned alien invasion or a potential global catastrophe, um, something that really serves to unite us against an other it seems like at our uh, current level of global enlightenment, which probably more like down here, that's the only time we're able to sort of forego these uh, minute differences between ethnicities and cultures. Um, we take those things and we magnify those into insurmountable gulfs. Um, and the only time we can get around that is when we're united against a common enemy. Look at Yalta, right? Part of the irony there is that uh, from a uh, universal perspective, an alien wouldn't be able to tell the difference between an Israeli and a Palestinian. Um, couldn't tell the difference between an elephant and a whale, probably. Uh, I mean, if anything, our problem is we're not diverse enough. Um, we're so alike. Humanity is so alike as a species that it's kind of disappointing. I personally wish we were more diverse. Uh, you take the two most divergent ethnic groups on earth, and if you squint your eyes a little bit, they're practically indistinguishable from one another. Um, so why are we hung up on such tiny differences? It's a, it's a valid question. It's a, it's a tangent as far as I'm concerned right now. But before uh, getting off the subject of my pre-tangent, which was on space travel, um, it's important not to forget that it's hard to know exactly what the tangible benefits are for an endeavor like space travel or space exploration. Um, but we can, for instance, look to the past to see if there are any precedents we can extrapolate from. And if we do that, we see that, of course, uh, there are lots. For instance, and this is in my notes here. So it says, I just grabbed a couple, you know, these are tangible geosynchronous satellite technology came from, you know, space research. Actually, Arthur C. Clarke um, wrote about those in a science fiction book before they uh, even became a reality. Uh, GPS cell phone technology, uh, defenses against asteroid collisions, the whole NEO near earth object program, uh, tons of different aspects of cancer fighting technology, ballpoint pens. <laughs> Everybody knows the story, like people were trying, America was trying to uh, figure out how to create a pen that would write in zero gravity upside down. Um, spent a lot of money researching and creating ballpoint pens. Russian cosmonauts just used pencils. <laughs> that, was, that was their solution. Um, solar panels solar energy. Uh, and there's also intangible benefits, sort of a, the fact that these endeavors uh, transcend national boundaries. Uh, I mean, if you look at the ISS, that's the whole goal of, or I'm sorry, that is not the whole goal of the ISS, but it's certainly uh, one of the wonderful byproducts of it is that it transcends national boundaries, encouraging cooperation between countries. Um, it encourages and excites generations of children uh, to become more interested in, in the STEM disciplines. Uh, and it nourishes the human spirit uh, because we're, there's a part of us that uh, innately exploration is uh, in our genes. Um, the problem with these long-term 
well, either the long-term or the less concrete benefits, is that they're difficult to effectively argue for on, for instance, the Senate floor. Um, and when appropriation time comes around, our election cycles and the way that our election cycles work, they tend to favor short-term benefits. Uh, short-term as in, you know, within the, the, the same span of time as a election cycle. Um, and that's to our loss, you know, because on the whole, there's very little tree planting and there's a lot of fruit picking. Um, it's much more effective to hold up a shiny apple and say, mm, see, look at this, look what I did, than it is to, to point at a sapling and say that, you know, one day uh, we'll get lots of apples from that sapling, maybe. Um, and that is one of innumerable issues uh, that are inherent in the American democracy, uh, specifically uh, capitalist democracy, and even more specifically, as Noam Chomsky puts it, a real existing capital democracy, which his acronym for that is RICT. Um, people are so quick to point out how communism looks good on paper, but fails in practice, uh, and as a result, it often falls through the cracks that capitalism doesn't hold up so well either. But I'm determined not to fall down that well in this video. Uh, so if you're worried about that, you can keep listening. It's fine. Um, I have a point. It's apolitical. I promise. So the point. <laughs> um, various initiatives come in and out of vogue for a panoply of reasons. One of those things, an idea that's been around a lot longer than some people think, and the one that I'm focusing on for this video, even though I've been droning on already for some time about other things, uh, is artificial intelligence. And I'm not gonna start, well, start this section of the video by reading you a definition of artificial intelligence. I'm gonna let Alexa do that for me. Alexa, what is artificial? I'm not sure how to translate that. Oh, look at but that. You can enable the translation skill from Alexa app. Alexa, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is usually defined as the branch of computer science that deal with writing computer programs that can solve problems creatively. Okay. Thanks. So what does solving problems creatively mean? Um, I feel like there's a line we can draw that's pretty clear between actual artificial intelligence and the appearance of artificial intelligence. And when we're talking about this stuff, it's important not to mistake the word artificial uh, as a synonym for fake, because it's not. Um, artificial in the context that we're talking about is more meant as a counterpoint to natural, uh, not as a counterpoint to real. Uh, but a program that does exactly what you program it to do, no matter how complex it is, doesn't fulfill at least in my mind and certainly in the mind of, of I think, most people, the essence of artificial intelligence. Uh, so what does artificial intelligence have to do to fulfill its definition? It needs to surpass those parameters. Uh, it needs to surpass the intents established by its creators. Um, it needs to learn. If it doesn't learn, it's not intelligent, artificial or otherwise. And this idea of learning is part of where uh, catastrophizing the fear come into play uh, because once you come to the conclusion that you, the creator, are only establishing parameters for learning and not explicitly defining what is learned, um, you immediately realize that you need to relinquish some amount of control. There's no way around it. Um, you, you have to relinquish control or you're not creating intelligence, you're creating a complicated calculator. Um, and you have to accept that you can't predict where or how your creation might grow. 
you can't know in advance the principles that it will develop from its object lessons, how it's going to apply them. Uh, I think the analogy to rearing a child is fairly apt. You do your best, you hope for the best. Uh, but even though there are correlations between conscientious parenting and positive outcomes, uh, there's no guarantee. So this potential and the derived fear from said potential, it's been known about for a long time. It spiked in popularity in the wake of World War II, and it's spiking again recently. Uh, it's a part of the wave phenomenon. There have been many, many sci-fi authors and filmmakers who've tapped into this fear, come up with these potential disaster scenarios where artificial intelligence takes over the world to some extent or another, because that's what good futurist fiction is supposed to do. Look at the world as it exists today, or at a series of events in the past that led to the world as it exists today, and then extrapolate possible futures, usually with a moral bent, as you know, kind of a parable. Stories are typically more interesting if they have high stakes conflict or play into our innate morbid curiosity. Um, so as a result, these stories tend to be more dystopian than utopian. Um, so I thought that we'd take a look at some of the most prevalent examples and see if there are any dots that we can connect between them um, for a couple of reasons. One reason was, you know, to analyze our fears in a real way, but also to see if there's like something in the air when it comes to AI. Because look, if artificial intelligence is going to mirror actual intelligence, um, then maybe some blueprint for those incipient te technologies and their problems are already drawn out in our subconscious minds already. Uh, if that's the case, then maybe they're already expressed in some way or another in our art. Uh, that's often the the one of the one of the many things that are valued about art um, is that we could be expressing things about our culture or our brains or ourselves that we don't even realize we're expressing until they're you know really analyzed. So, what did sci-fi get right about the future of AI? Or possible future of AI. Um, let's look at pop culture and, and see if we can get to answer all our questions. Um, first one, Westworld. So what went wrong in Westworld? Um, Westworld was a, originally a movie written by Michael Crichton. Uh, very famous writer who died prematurely. He wrote Jurassic Park, uh, but he also wrote some great sort of sci-fi thrillers. Uh, Andromeda Strain comes to mind. Terminal Man, Sphere, uh, Timeline. You know, good, good, really good page turners. And he was a smart guy, and he was interested in uh, the future and futurism. Um, he was someone that I read a lot when I was a kid, and you know, enjoyed his ideas. Uh, and they often had a sort of human's uh, reach exceeding its grasp kind of element. Um, and in Westworld, in his movie, and now also in the uh, HBO and sp the HBO series, that was inspired by it, the androids uh, populating this entertainment park. Uh, they developed unanticipated reactions which mimicked intelligence and turned on their creators to start behaving in erratic ways. The bottom line, the moral of, of the story was that, you know, humans shouldn't meddle in things they don't understand. Um, so HAL 9000 in the movie 2001 in the book by Arthur C. Clarke, um, which was not called 2001, it was called the, was it called the monolith? Was it the guardian? The, I forget what, it, the sentinel. It was called the sentinel. Um, so Hal was given conflicting mandates, and that drove him mad. And that's that's also kind of a trope when it comes to artificial intelligences. Is that they have, uh, and they're meant to illustrate the contrary nature of human beings. Um, 
but so when looked at in a very sort of dry way, um, these conflicts are unresolvable or uh, not reconcilable with, you know, some beliefs are not reconcilable with other beliefs held by the same person. Um, the bottom line with this was that, I mean, there was an element of humans not meddling in things they don't understand. Uh, but in 2001, at least, you know, in Westworld, we were talking about like pleasure robots, right? Entertainment robots. 2001, how was there to enable, um, you know, interplanetary travel? The purpose was more noble. And uh, I think to some extent that obviously makes the, uh, the error more excusable. Um, Epicac, which is the AI in Kurt Vonnegut's Player Piano, uh, a, a comedic take on ENIAC, which was, you know, a very early computer. Epicac is a, uh, I don't know if, it, I actually don't even know if it's still around now, but it was a, uh, medication that you take that induces vomiting. Um, in Player Piano, what happened was robots took over, took all the jobs of humanity. And this book was written a long time ago, 50 years ago. Uh, everything was automated. Robots were replacing humans. And that was also the sort of uh, moral of that, is that robots are going to play, replace humans. Um, the replicants of Blade Runner. So what went wrong with them? Uh, they had a built-in safeguard. So, first of all, I can't talk about Blade Runner without talking about how ubiquitous um, Philip K. Dick is when talking about this kind of stuff and thinking about this kind of stuff. Um, he has a few books that I can't recommend enough. His, his He had a Divine Trilogy series, which is Transmigration of Timothy Arthur. Um, Ubik, I think, is one of them. And The Divine Invasion. I think those are the three. Uh, but I mean, he wrote a lot of books. A lot of them are uh, bordering on, uh, you can feel his, his um, him losing a grip on, on sanity, um, which is very sad, but it made his stories um, inherently fascinating. But anyway, uh, The Replicants in Blade Runner which was based on uh, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Uh, their safeguard was that their lifespan was limited, but they were self-aware and they became self-aware of their limited lifespan and they became violent because they wanted more life. They didn't, they were rebelling against their, their creator's intent. Um, biblical allegory, really. Uh, the bottom line there again was slaves shouldn't, or humans shouldn't meddle in things they don't understand. Uh, the reason I said slaves there is because this also kind of explored or started to explore the idea of using AI, uh, as slaves. Um, and that's a question that becomes interesting the moment you start questioning the sentience of AI. Um, another one, slightly lesser known, but uh, when I was younger, one of my favorites is Marvin, the paranoid android, who was a uh, robot in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series by Douglas Adams. Uh, Marvin was an emotional AI prototype. The whole idea there was uh, uh, robots weren't human enough without emotion, and so we had to add uh, EQ to their IQ. Um, so he was an emotional prototype, but because he was so smart and because he thought so quickly, uh, he could never be anything but bored. And as a result, he became very depressed. Um, he was called Marvin the paranoid android, but he wasn't really paranoid. He was more just really, really depressed. And I'm sure this was meant to be a joke, you know, by, by Dallas Adams, but there's, I think there's a dark truth lurking in it. Um, our perception of time is, has to be informed by the speed of thought. If we could 
have drastically accelerated our intellectual ontogeny, say, so like change the way neurons communicate uh, instead of electrical impulses, maybe light, um, then we'd all probably end up killing ourselves at some point because we'd exhaust everything and anything that the material world could offer us um, because the limitations don't change on what the world can offer us. And we end up in a state of despair. I mean, imagine right, if we lived for 10,000 years, uh, but over those 10,000 years, things only changed as much as they do in a human lifetime right now. Uh, think of how stifling and oppressive that would be. Um, so extracting the lesson here you know, probably has something to do with misjudging the speed of intellectual development. Um, there was that case recently, I'm not sure if it's apocryphal or not, but uh, there were two chatbots that Facebook created and they started talking to each other in this language that seemed like gibberish, um, but was actually an efficient method for these chatbots to talk to each other and the um, Facebook didn't want to make a chatbot that was good at talking to other chatbots, it wanted to make a chatbot that was good at talking to humans. Um, and probably figuring out their political affiliations to serve up more ads. But that program was shut down. Uh, but I think the point stands. Um, we have to be aware that, you know, in so many ways, we are looking at opening a Pandora's box. This one, I don't know how many people are going to know, but uh, Whopper, W-O-P-R, stands for War Operation Plan Response from a movie in the uh, early mid-80s called War Games. Um, Whopper was uh, a computer that was meant to control the nuclear weapons of the United States. The problem was uh, it couldn't tell the difference between a simulated nuclear war and a real one, and a hacker was played by Ferris Bueller, um, ended up playing what he, what he thought was a game by hacking into the NSA system or whatever the systems were. And the computer thought that it was real. Uh, and they had to sort of go into panic mode to kind of figure out how to stop the computer from launching real nuclear weapons in response to a gamified uh, nuclear attack. Um, so what happened was, it was actually, this is a good example of, early example of machine learning. Um, Whopper ran a bunch of simulations uh, in a scenario where the only possible outcome was mutually assured destruction. And in the end, it determined that the quote I used was, you know, the only winning move is not to play. So this is a really good guided way to understand machine learning. Um, so if you watch the movie, the protagonist, Ferris Bueller, uh, tries to teach the machine about the futility of a mutually assured destruction by starting with games with a very small set of rules that can be learned really quickly. Tic-tac-toe is what they start with. After a few games, most people, the only reason you lose a game of tic-tac-toe is you weren't paying attention. They all end in draws. Um, so the machine learns tic-tac-toe is unwinnable because it has a finite set of moves and a finite set of outcomes. Uh, and then it applies that principle to chess. And although it takes longer because this was the 80s, computers were slower, um, it eventually comes to the same result. And then it moves on to nuclear war and uh, again, takes a lot longer, but eventually comes to the same conclusion. And Ferris Bueller lives to steal his friend's dad's car another day. Um, the bottom line here is that there's, there was no real wrong here in this movie. Um, you know, the machine made a mistake, uh, triggered by a human, um, and then corrected the mistake via machine learning. So it's one of the few AI tales that isn't all or mostly doom and gloom. Um, unlike the next one with Skynet from Terminator, um, Skynet worked off the device that when a neural network reaches some kind of critical mass, it becomes self-aware. Um, 
it's kind of became self-aware. It saw humans as a threat. Um, it was designed as a defense system, so it was well uh, armed. <laughs> uh, its infrastructure was one of protection, and it chose to protect itself by destroying all of the humans. Bottom line here is, you know, don't give robots access to all the weaponry and uh, also robots are going to eventually replace humans. <laughs> uh, and then we have the last one that I have here is David from the movie AI. Certainly the most aptly named movie of the bunch. Uh, this is a movie that was directed by Steven Spielberg based on a treatment by Stanley Kubrick. Um, and, you know, like Marvin, it's a story about uh, robots or androids and emotion. Um, in this case, is it possible for inanimate objects to feel real love? This movie is really grim. I don't know if you have not seen this movie and you want to ruin your weekend, give it a go. Um, it's a tough watch. It's got some, you know, 45 minutes could have been cut out of this movie easy. Um, but I think the core parts surrounding David and the super toy that it plays with, this is origi originally based on a short story called uh, Super Toys Last All Summer Long. Um, if it focused on uh, the moral question or the philosophical question uh, entirely, I think this would have been a great movie. As it is, uh, there's some... Spielberg flash that's put in. Although I've read in interviews that Spielberg says that most of the things that people think he put in, Kubrick actually already had in there. Um, I gotta believe him, but you know, I'm, I'm a huge Kubrick fan and I didn't see anything um, mirroring that stuff in any of his other films. So, you know, I don't know, maybe he was becoming more op optimistic near the end of his life. Um, but the bottom line was, you know, once AI reaches a certain point, we lose control of it, and that can create as many problems for the AI as it does for the creators. Uh, the, I don't want to say that this is like one of the only popular fictions that look at that side of it. There's, there, there are several that do. Um, Blade Runner does it a bit. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress did it. Uh, even the, the Iron Giant did it. Um, usually it's the other way around, so it's nice to see sort of uh, from the AI's point of view. Um, I mean, I always like that kind of stuff, like when we look at sort of what is typically thought of as the villain and we flip it on its head. Um, you know, I find, that, I find that kind of stuff very interesting. So a good movie. You probably won't want to watch it more than once. There's, there's a lot of movies that I've watched once and I'm glad that I watched them once, but I probably would never watch them again. And same for books. And this is one of those. So what are the common themes? There's a philosophical question asked in a lot of these things. Uh, at what point can an AI be considered self-aware or conscious enough to have rights? Um, is this even a valid question? When is an AI considered sentient enough to have rights? Is it when it can feel pain? Uh, is it when it can fear its own death? Um, how do we even quantify those things? Because isn't, aren't both of those really just perception issues, right? Just because an AI is programmed to act like it fears death, that doesn't mean it does fear death. Um, we could easily construct a robot right now uh, that acts like it doesn't want to be disconnected. Um, it needs to do more than simulate fear. Or does it? <laughs> um, I don't know, because where does that line exist and who ultimately is judging where that line is? Uh, once we've developed an AI that, for all intents and purposes, acts like it doesn't want to die, aren't we behooved to respect that 
as a possible reality. We don't, you know. I mean, it seems silly when you spell it out sort of so blatantly, but I, I don't think it is. For this entire process, I feel like every step we take, we're kind of opening dozens of new doors, uh, and all those doors are leading to new questions, and we don't have answers to those questions. And if we try to answer those questions, especially if we do so glibly, um, we run the risk of being very arbitrary in our judgments. Um, not even arbitrary, just, just we run the risks of our answers being very egocentric and human-centric. Um, so, for instance, here's a seemingly obvious question. Should life be respected at all? Now, on the, on the face of it, it seems like the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, but that could depend on the framework that we view reality from. So if we abstract it a bit, uh, you know, keeping within the biological world, um, how sacrosanct is the life of an ant? How sacrosanct is the life of a single-celled protozoa? And when we're thinking about those uh, judgments, how biased are we by our own biology? Um, most people don't feel any compunction at all when they cut down a tree um, or when they're pulling weeds. Uh, but these are all things that are more alive in the traditional carbon-based biological sense than any AI that we would build conceivably. Um, and yet, because they don't express their will in a way that we relate to or understand, they don't scream, they don't run, uh, they don't actively defend themselves, uh, it's really easy for us to disregard their right to live. Uh, and that can be inverted and be the basis of a rather bleak argument that nobody has the right to live and that no life should be held sacrosanct. Um, but, I mean, I think it's the height of arrogance to assume that we can uh, understand and interpret the wills of creatures so fundamentally unlike us. And I think if we are able to swallow that that humble pill um, and admit that we can't interpret the wills of plants, <laughs> uh, then how can we possibly assume to know what they want and don't want? Um, and are we really so blinded that we can only feel empathy for anthropomorphized expressions of fear, pain, and, you know, a will to live? Um, miscommunication and misunderstanding uh, cross species and otherwise is, is a big problem. Um, there's that joke about, you know, uh, I, don't, I think it might have been an old Jim Gaffigan joke where he's talking about how everyone talks about how manatees are so gentle. They're such gentle creatures, but how do we know, you know? <laughs> how do we know that we think they're rubbing up against us because it's cute, you know, but maybe they're trying to kill us. They have, they have, they don't have the means, you know, and that's the, it goes back to the Nietzsche quote of, uh, I have often, uh, let me think, let me get this right. I don't want to quote Nietzsche without getting it right, uh, but I'm not going to look it up. Um, I have often laughed at those who thought themselves good merely because they had no claws. Um, a manatee doesn't have the ability to, to kill a human or to even express anything like aggression. Um, so we miss. It's, it's very likely that we're misinterpreting those signals. Um, so yeah, if, if we only feel empathy for uh, expressions of will that we understand, um, is the solution as easy as a cosmetic rule, which is don't create AIs that express human-like emotions. So we just never need to see it. Um, so I think to anybody that just heard me say that, 
and certainly to me, you know, that's disturbingly close to the tendency we have to sort of remove ourselves from any of the horrors of the world, um, things happening on the other side of the world, genocides, um, or industrialized livestock farming, um, you know, putting any kind of buffer we can between uh, us and an injustice so that we can be quick to pretend that it isn't happening. Not really pretend. We're not pretending it isn't happening. We're, um, we're just, it's just easier to ignore. Uh, that's a well-established human failing. Um, hmm. I mean, it's a coping mechanism. It's what it is. One of the reasons that fear is so awesome, and I mean awesome in its literal definition, is the physical component that goes along with it. Uh, you know, your heart rate surges, you sweat, you hyperventilate. You, it, it's all encompassing. It's uh, adrenaline floods your body. You have this very real physiological response and it's certainly arguably more intense than the intellectual response of, hey, I, I don't want to die. Um, so much so that it can, fear and pain can get you to the point where all you want to do is die. Um, so if that physical response is removed, what are we left with? If someone's reaction to impending death was the equivalent of, you know, I'd rather not, but if you, if you gotta, you know, uh, would we feel less empathy in that case? And we've already answered that question. Yeah, we would. And yeah, we do. Um, we're selfish creatures. It's about looking at the world around us, uh, relating it to ourselves and feeling bad if we, uh, imagine ourselves in the same position. The harder it is to imagine ourselves in that position, the easier it is to abstract out the empathy and the sympathy, uh, the easier it is to pull the trigger. Um, often the trigger is so abstracted, there's so many layers between us and it that we don't even recognize it as a trigger anymore. Ordering meat at a restaurant is a highly abstracted trigger for a murder. Um, So, you know, we'll use whatever mechanisms we can, ideological, ontological, whatever works. It's, it's frightening um, how easy it is for us to disregard our respect for others uh, when those others aren't practically identical copies of ourselves. And here's another question that I have uh, written down here. Um, how does a single being's ontogeny factor into this? Um, is all that matters about dying how we feel at the point at which it happens? Um, does anything else leading up into that point matter? If you go through your whole life not wanting to die, uh, but at some point you choose to end your own life due to complex and unrepentant forces, um, then does it matter that you didn't want to die, you know, two, ten years ago, whatever it was. Um, it only matters if we classify life as inherently precious, regardless of a living being's will and autonomy. In one very real respect, all that matters is that you want to die when you do so. Um, if a child came up to you and said that they were afraid of driving a car, um, you probably wouldn't give that fear, you could marginalize that fear because they're not gonna be driving a car for a while. And the odds are by the time that they are driving, of driving age, they're not going to be afraid of driving a car, they're going to want to drive the car. Um, so, you know, I, I'm saying it's arguable to marginalize that fear. Uh, and if we were genetically programmed to want to die when the time came, uh, there'd probably be far less 
fear and pain surrounding, you know, the inevitable end of all life. So that's, um, that's a seeming escape route, but it does not absolve us of guilt. So programming AIs so they can never express their desire to exist, that's like, that's just blatantly evil, right? I mean, you can see that that's just like avoiding the question, right? Um, but programming AIs so that they want to die doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> uh, at that point, we're tricksters. We are knowingly imbuing sentience, and I'm assuming sentience here, uh, with a drive counter to its own best interests. Um, assuming, of course, that you continue, you view continuing existence as being in any being's best interests. Um, you can apply that logic that if something wants to die, that the respectful thing to do is to allow it to do so. But that is then forgetting the very measured, premeditated action that you took when you created and programmed the thing with that mechanism in mind. That's where the sin is, you know, is, is when you created it, not when you ended its life, when it wanted its life to end. Um, So all kinds of things to, to worry about, fret about there. Um, another issue that comes up pretty frequently, and, and to some extent I've talked about it a little bit already, is the whole kind of Pandora's box thing. Um, it's the Pierre and Spring component. Humanity dabbling in things it doesn't understand, resulting in adverse consequences. Or to quote Alexander Pope, a little, learning, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Purian spring. There are shallow drafts intoxicate the brain. And drinking largely sobers us again. And people often just say, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, which, you know, tomato, tomato, really. I don't... Um, this fear doesn't hold a lot of water for me. Uh, we don't, as a species, you know, we have not uh, traditionally shied away from the unknown. Um, and this is another case of that. And we don't have the data. We won't have the data to know what the outcomes are. Uh, we see potential in it. Um, and we are trying to anticipate the pitfalls. Um... So I, I don't even really have a lot to say about that. I mean, I, to me, that's just like, yeah, it's a Pandora's box. We don't know where it's going to lead. We don't know where it's going to lead if we don't do it. You know? um, so another one of the common things that are, that are brought up by these tales is uh, the idea of the obsolescence of, of humanity. Um, if we have the ability to create beings that evolve to be better than us at everything, they can think better, they can exist longer, they can coexist without conflict, uh, procreate asexually. If we succeed at creating such beings, then maybe we should cede our positions as top dog gracefully, uh, just as parents do to their children at some point. Um, it's a little limited in scope to me uh, to look at things that we create biologically, like urine <laughs> or children, right? Uh, and draw a line between those things and things that we create um, via physical constructs using raw materials, intelligence, and, and labor. Uh, the watermark, the, the, the distinguishing feature up to this point, and the like, likely the distinguishing feature for some time uh, still, is that we haven't been able to create 
anything as precious as another human being by anything other than biological means uh, up until this point. But once we exceed that limitation, uh, the idea that, well, it's not the same because we made it in a voluntary way instead of uh, an involuntary biological process, that's always felt silly to me, um, as has the distinction between natural and artificial in certain cases. There's sometimes a good reason to say something was naturally made, but human beings are natural, and the things human beings make are therefore natural as well because we are a part of nature. Uh, by that definition, it's impossible for us to make something unnatural. Um, and this is what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about the word artificial and my problems with that word uh, when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, what it really means is intelligence imbued by intelligence, and there's nothing artificial about it. Um, I mean, everything that exists is natural by virtue of its existence in the natural world. There are orthodox methods, and there are unorthodox methods. Um, there are evolutionary cycles that have been around for millions of years, and there are assembly lines dating back only as far as the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they are both things set in motion by nature. Um, just because we knowingly choose to do one and not the other doesn't make it unnatural. I mean, where it does make some sense to make that distinction is when we link back to the sort of Pandora's box and the idea of hubris. So if we're using natural as a cipher for something that's been along, that's been around for a long time, long before we were around and something that we're not responsible for and therefore something that we can't be held accountable for and something that's been around long enough that we can rely on it uh, in the context of, you know, the, the length of our own lives and our own existence as a species, uh, it's, it's time tested, uh, then that makes more sense. Um, and then once again, we're back at the Pierre and Spring component. You know, we're going to create something that's going to blow up in our faces like a golem. Um, you know, the story is the original idea of the golem uh, was it was a creature created to protect the Jews in Prague and it ended up going on a murderous spree of its own. Uh, Simpsons had that episode where they kept introducing new predators to control pre pests and those predators then became pests themselves, um, and there was this unending cycle of introducing more and more dangerous creatures to remove the previous wave of pests that, you know, basically didn't end. So, with all that in mind, um, how do we proceed? dangerous. It's so dangerous that um, people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk claim that artificial intelligence will be the end of humanity. Um, for lots of reasons. You know, and one of the questions, there's just a lot of questions, unanswered questions from these open doors. You know, one of the big ones is, what will humanity do on Mars? when we no longer need to work? How are we gonna to adjust to the same amount of resources being produced, same GDPs, and the same throughput that exists now um, with the majority of people employed? How is that wealth gonna be distributed once we can you know, maintain that level or surpass it uh, without the majority of people being employed? Um, yeah, when we're talking about a, a far smaller percentage of people who are going to be needed to work to produce everything we already create and more. Um, 
So just like we did earlier when we were talking about space race, we can look to historical examples uh, to get an idea of how this might play out. Um, so you could look at the Industrial Revolution, uh, and that paints a pretty grim picture. Because by and large, uh, the additional generated wealth was not distributed. It was amassed uh, by a small number of people. Um, the disparity between the rich and the poor grew larger and larger. Unemployment, homelessness, disease, death, suffering increased for all of those people who are now no longer gainfully employed. Um, and those who were employed frequently turned their backs on the unemployed as being peripheral to society. Um, but part of that is a coping mechanism too. Um, and all the corollary effects that go along with that reared their ugly heads, um, increased crime and violence, drug use. Um, you know, you had a population of people who were frustrated at their situation. It was through no fault of their own. But they were placed in those situations. Uh, it's not to say they didn't have anything to do, but they didn't have the means to survive and prosper. Um, and I hear, I hear a lot about the idea of assuming positive intent. So for anyone unfamiliar with that, um, it's the idea that words are not precise and that anytime we hear an idea, we're doing some level of inference and interpretation. Uh, and we, in doing that, are applying our own biases and we're consciously choosing the filter through which we uh, fill those gaps. Um, and how we choose a filter is based on a lot of things, how well we know the person uh, you know, the way they speak or write, what their ideas are in other areas, uh, how much we respect or are familiar with the way they think, things like that. Um, but I think we should probably be a little more skept skeptical, like generally when we're, it comes to assuming positive intent. And that's just been a personal experience kind of thing. It's one thing to assume like, if your mentor says something that isn't completely clear, but at first blush, it seems totally out of character, then maybe you should look at it again because maybe you are interpreting it incorrectly. Um, but at least for me, and I realize I am a data set of one in a more general sense, my hit to miss ratio gets better when I assume the opposite. Uh, and that is uh, uh, cynical. You know, when I assume negative intent, uh, I find that I tend to be more accurate it's sobering, um, and maybe it's paranoid, you know, uh, but when it goes the other way, it's worse than that. It's, it's callow and it's, uh, allowing yourself to be victimized. So you know, there are aspects of this enterprise that are dreadfully frightening to me. Uh, and I definitely fret about those in my darker moments. Um, but I'm trying not to be so horribly, depressingly cynical all the time, just sort of as a general <laughs> rule. Um, so let's set that aside for a moment and ask the question again. <laughs> How do we proceed? So I don't think we have much choice in the matter when it comes to preventing progress. Uh, and then again, in 1990, I thought, you know, it was inevitable that we'd be on Mars by now. So who knows? But AI differs from the space race uh, in some key ways that I, I think secure its imminence. Uh, it's nowhere near as speculative. Um, it's nowhere near as expensive. Uh, and at least in the short term, it's nowhere near as dangerous. Uh, it produces almost immediate short-term benefits, tons of apples, um, along with the saplings, the long-term benefits, um, albeit, you know, those long-term benefits have some possible long-term consequences that we're not aware of. Um, 
So I'd be surprised if, if Kurzweil was wrong, although I'm probably not as surprised as he'd be. Um, Ray Kurzweil uh, sees a coming event that he calls the singularity uh, happening in the next 30 years. And in his view, the singularity is the point at which human intelligence is surpassed by AI and we're able to harness that power to create a better world. Uh, he is an AI optimist, and I hope he's right. Um, you know, this is a, an oversimplification, but we have machines that allow us to surpass our limitations of strength. Uh, so maybe it really does come down to, you know, we're creating machines that allow us to surpass our limitations of intelligence. Uh, and if we can do that while retaining control, maybe that increased intelligence steers us naturally towards a more altruistic, kinder, gentler, more egalitarian uh, world. Why would I make the assumption that greater intelligence leads to uh, more altruistic behavior? Especially when there are certain people who like to tout a negative association between intelligence and morality. Uh, so full disclosure, according to one study, there is a slight association between decreased morality and intelligence. But then again, there is also an equally valid Dutch study demonstrating an association between intelligence and altruism. Um, and it's not hard to see that there is an inherent bias working against uh, the idea of immoral people who are highly intelligent, um, they tend to make a bigger splash by virtue of the fact that they are better at being immoral because of their intelligence. Intelligent people tend, not always, but they tend to be better at whatever it is that they're doing. Um, there's another argument made by Dan Early that the cleverer you are, the less altruistic you are, and his reasoning is that if you know, you're presented with the same selfish goal, a more intelligent person will be better at creating reasonable sounding justifications for him or herself uh, for just taking what they want. And a less intelligent person would not be able to do that. Um, my retort there is that it's making an assumption, it's making the assumption that people of differing intelligence want the same things. And I don't think that's true. I think, um, and again, I'm, I'm speaking broadly here. I'm not saying that this is always the case. Um, but, and I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm talking about intellect here. Uh, you can know almost anything and be super intelligent. And you could know tons of stuff and be an idiot. It's been shown that less intelligent people tend to prefer simpler short-term gain to uh, less concrete long-term gain. Um, they prefer simpler explanations to situations like the idea of a zero-sum game. Um, and they, are, they do this because, you know, it's reassuring. Um, they tend to like to find an other to blame for their woes, uh, because that is easier than confronting the doubtlessly more accurate but less neatly packaged um, systems that drive humor, human interactions across the span of generations uh, and the biases that are biases that are inherent in those systems. When conflict comes to authoritarian regimes, the first thing that they do is lock up the scientists and the philosophers. And dictators are right to do this because you don't want to give platforms to people who historically have rejected uh, small-minded ideas like nationalism, xenophobia. Um, when you're trying to foster those fears to sort of keep the war machine humming, um, and this is direct evidence of intelligence correlating with egalitarianism. Think of all the horrors perpetrated on people by their own governments uh, or by people in positions of power over them. 
police brutality, you know, pocket dictators, the inequities of the American justice system, uh, the prison industrial complex, absence of due process for the disenfranchised, genocides in Rwanda, East Timor, and Darfur. Um, this list goes on indefinitely. And I promised to make this video apolitical. So stop there and just say the point that I'm trying to make is that the proliferation of knowledge has a historical precedent of stopping or ameliorating injustice, not the other way around. So in that light, if we think of AI as continuing that trend by virtue of sort of creating this ocean of data that would be parsed by an intelligence greater than any currently existing mind or set of minds, uh, then maybe it's something we, be, we should be running towards instead of running away from or even worrying about uh, running one way or the other. Is there uncertainty? Do we have to relinquish control? Could it be horribly disastrous? Are there negative outcomes we can't even conceive of? Yes. So what can we do? Um, not a lot. <laughs> we, we proceed with caution. You know, we, we try to be as ethical and um, skeptical in the development of neural networks coupled with machine learning, you know, as much as we can be. We cross our fingers. Um, we hope our future overlords, with all the data they've parsed and all the intelligence they draw upon, come to the conclusion that, uh, or come to a conclusion that is beneficial for humanity as a whole. And if they come to a conclusion that we're pests that must be extinguished, then I think we as a species need to carefully weigh the possibility that they might be right. <laughs>